Hi there, I'm Vince and welcome to the Vince Unlimited channel. One of the great things about having your own YouTube channel is that you can have a big whinging rant about absolutely anything you like. Just have a blast and get it off your hairy chest. No arguments or counter thoughts, at least until the comment section lights up that is. So I figure it's time I lobbed in a handful of my own thoughts about some random things on a few subjects into the mix. I know, I know, only recently I was putting out a video claiming to be an ideas man. And now I'm back with video this time about my opinions. Opinions, ideas, animations, bikes, cars, comedy, ships, stories, technology, trains. You might just be getting the idea that my videos could be about anything and everything. And you'd be right. Vince Unlimited is clearly there in the title. What isn't in the title is a warning that some of the contents of my subjects may be a bit strong for some. Opinionated, certainly, but isn't that the point? You don't move preconceptions without great and sum up the wrong way. But hey, they're my own thoughts. If you look carefully, there's often a spot of tongue in the odd cheek. If you don't agree with my take on the subjects, then don't take it personally. It's easy enough to offer your own alternative takes on things. Free speech is the greatest gift we have. I cherish it. Millennium Dome, a tribute to the Greenwich Blister. Do you recall the Millennium Dome? If not, have you heard of the O2 Arena? Well, the O2 Arena was originally planned to be constructed on the site of the formerly infamous Millennium Dome using a lot of the bits rearranged similarly in the same configuration, in precisely the same location. Clever. But I want you to come back with me to the time they erected the original. It was around the turn of the 20th to 21st millennium, uh, which many suggested has influenced its nomenclature. The building was purposed as a temporary tent to house a celebratory show of contemporary arts, design, technology, knowledge and fun called the Millennium Experience. At the time, it was questioned whether it was an enormous car bunk or a visionary monument. Many said that the cash should have been spent on the NHS instead. People questioned the extravagance of a structure built of a seemingly temporary design and only there for a year. And no one could see where the 800 million and counting was heading. So why was I a supporter of this apparently whitest of elephants? Let's consider some facts. The dome was built in the UK, not a financially struggling poor country riddled with debt and plagued by civil war. Britain was and is a major world power, so why shouldn't we be able to afford a bit of luxury now and again? I consider the money better spent on this plaything, even if only for a comparative few, than for another weapon of mass destruction, for instance. And I did not believe that one hospital or even nurse would be cancelled because of the project. I accepted that, much like it still is today, the National Health Service was underfunded and I'd have been happy to pay additional taxes if I could guarantee an efficient service. But I did not confuse that with the issue with the dome. That, I felt, was the job of the British press. As for the contents, I'm not a believer of criticism without seeing things firsthand. So I visited this monument in its heyday, in early March 2000, and enjoyed the whole day out. The content was generally of an excellent nature and there was more to check out than I could manage in a single day visit. In particular, I noted that the journey zone was top draw stuff. The only disappointment I experienced was the main centre stage show. It was set on too grand a scale with multiple things confusingly happening everywhere, all at once set against a pretentious storyline far too up its tent pole to make any sense. My opinion at the time, which I eventually proffered in my own website in October 2003, was that the dome would eventually be fondly remembered. At the time, I noted how the media in this country was attempting to control how we perceived this image of this stunning structure. Up to then, the press had been slagging it off. It had already been a couple of years after opening, then closing the door on this year-long exhibition, and its image was at a low point. So I guess the media mongrels, uh, yes, you did hear me say that correctly, would inevitably decide it was time to relaunch it, once again as a success story. I was already a champion for its right to be and suggested that we thought about the publicity we could get for our country if we all got behind it. I believed it was big enough. And as for the original, much derided slogan, only open for a year, 
I remarked that it would still be up and running in some form in 20 years. Mark my words. And if you had read my article then and marked those words, then you would see that I was right. It was eventually successfully repurposed as a popular O2 arena in 2007. And now in 2022, it ranks as one of the biggest media venues in the world. And that is why my opinions are worth following and have been for at least a, most of the millennium. So let me tell you another, also first print of my 2003 website, but this time on a subject which is still as relevant today and coincidentally important to one of my most viewed YouTube videos. The meaning of hi-fi, or more correctly, the definition of the phrase hi-fi, and a direct attack on all those manufacturers and suppliers out there who bandy about the term hi-fi when it clearly isn't warranted. Hi-fi, or to give it its full title, high fidelity, was a word popularly introduced in the 70s. The term may be older, but its use became more widespread then, probably to coincide with the style of denim jeans at the time. The distinction allowed for sound equipment exhibiting the purity of sound extracted from the growing number of specialist separate components that outperformed the cheap all-in-one music centres of the time. I know the sound from 90s head-banging super-woofered ghetto blasters could outperform earlier 80s attempts at music reproduction, uh, plus later digital equipment had the ability to move the standards on, but that's not the point. The term hi-fi is a movable datum. As the general melee of equipment improves, the true high fidelity components are those that continue to rise above the contemporary masses and are consistently able to produce crisp, clear sounds to die for. And the number of lights, displays, bells and whistles don't count either. So next time someone tries to flog you an alleged hi-fi product at a minimal price even a teenager could afford, ask them how it compares to a top-end digital source coupled to a pair of dedicated amps running through some specialist cables to some major floor standing speakers and get them to demonstrate this to you. Then you would have had an idea how my own system at time sounded like. And I will build up to the details of this system in my series of planned videos on my own hi-fi journey as already started. Uh, links below, like, comment, subscribe, share, etc. And finally, if you want a fast track way to obtain the authentic hi-fi dream, other than long, hard, well-rewarded work, a lucky inheritance, or a devious bit of highly risky pilfering, then I might suggest taking a chance on a lottery ticket. And I say this only as a spurious link to my final opinion today. Lotto, my personal view of the British lottery system. I'm a big fan of lotteries. I was for the British National Lottery in 2003, that year again, when I pitted my thoughts on it in my website. I'm still a fan today, and suggested, where else could such a simple act as shelling out a pound bring such substantial life-altering consequences? Obviously the pound entry fee has risen a bit since then, but my thoughts remain exactly the same. I do not fall under the category of it, it won't change my life. The hell it will, big time. Well, that I've had or have such a bad life, it's just I always had an imagination. And too much of my precious time was spent doing what I must, not what I would like. So winning would be a truly selfish act. Yes, bring it on. I will not try to convince you that I play the game for the highly advertised good causes. As I stated in my Ideas Man video, I have a strong belief that we should not need charity because needs should be properly addressed through taxation. Ah, am I straying into a bonus opinion here? Anyway, I have no issue with the government taking a percentage of the lottery cost for extra special causes, as long as it stays that way. The causes should remain special, such as sports and activities, not overlap into need-based charity. I still occasionally play today, but now usually for the more possibly lucrative Euro millions, primarily because the winnings themselves could be highly generous to tempt me. The major downside I see in the lottery system is lack of integrity. Even with the national game virtually every week, I guess around two or more British players have made extremely wealthy. Original British lottery organisers Camelot, uh, then the group of Canadian teachers who bought the whole caboodle as a pension investment, both boasted over the years of hundreds of millionaires made, but each offered very little actual evidence. 
I watched over time and noted that shares in Bentley Motors did not seem to go through the roof. And few people are personally aware of any big time winners, except in the tiny minority of newsworthy reprobates featured in the red top ranks. And don't tell me that mostly winners want to keep their identities quiet, or that they're all wrinklies who do nothing but stuff it all under a mattress. Like many, if I won a jackpot, I'm sure everyone would know. A smile alone would give it away. For instance, what stops the organisers saying there are four jackpot winners when there's actually only one? I'm fairly sure that the system is correctly monitored, but the ease in which this could occur does stir the conspiracy side of my mind. It's my opinion that Camelot, Canadians or whoever so takes your place, you need to demonstrate your propriety better. Finally, just to lighten the mood, a simple lottery tip. Buy two sets of numbers for one draw. The second set, providing they are a different set, Numsky, it will double your chances of winning. You could not improve on that with such a small increased cost of entering. Shelling out for a third number set will only increase your chances by another half. A fourth set will only increase your chance by another third. And so forth. And don't play midweek. You'll just obliterate my chances of a rollover from the main weekend draw if you do win big. By the way, the renaming to Lotto didn't fool anyone. If anything, it made it sound cheap which I guess was the idea. Trouble is, it sounded cheap as in down market, not more affordable. In fact, to play, it was soon doubled just a single pound. And I, for one, never want to be lucky enough to be the winner of just a cheap win. What I couldn't do with 20 or more million. Well, a better YouTube channel for a start. Thanks for watching and for clicking on that little like button and for immediately subscribing to easily see more of my planned videos about my opinions or ideas, animations, bikes, cars, comedy, ships, stories, technology, trains, etc. This was a Vince Unlimited Opinions production written and presented by me, Vince. I record this on my Apple iPhone 14 Pro and then edited it on my Apple iPad Air 4th generation using the iMovie app, with the title card and end credits created in the Kino app. This is a film by Vince, copyright 2022.